Thank everybody for joining uh, our webinar today, another installment of Conserve America's webinar series. I'm Jeff Kupfer, uh, the president of Conserve America. And for those of you who are new to our organization, I just want to tell you a little bit about it. We are a nonprofit de dedicated to developing and promoting market-based solutions to our energy, environmental, and conservation challenges. <clears throat> We've been around for a couple decades, but have recently reinvigorated ourselves to help drive the policy debates towards more meaningful and durable solutions. And the timing is certainly appropriate as there's no shortage of issues uh, to address right now. Um, towards that end, we're working on many fronts, including supporting the Roosevelt Conservation Caucus, which is a bicameral group of conservative members of Congress who are focused on these issues as well as working on various policies and ho hosting these information uh, webinars. Today, we're really excited to discuss the topic of carbon pricing. This is not a new issue, uh, but as you will hear from our panelists, it's becoming even more important now as our country grapples with the best way to address climate change. Um, our panelists today will discuss the rationale for carbon pricing as well as the various issues associated with it. It'll explore ways that carbon pricing can be implemented, its impact on various industries and groups, alternatives, effectiveness in reducing emissions, international implications, and political dynamics uh, in Washington today. We got a great group of panelists and I'll just take a minute to introduce them. I could go on and on, but just to get things going, I'll just provide a little bit of an overview of everyone. Uh, we have Michael Greenstone, who's the Milton Friedman Distinguished Pro Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago, and also a director of their Energy Policy Institute. Uh, the Institute does a lot of really good work. And earlier this year, uh, issued a book called the US Energy and Climate Roadmap, uh, a whole bunch of different chapters on various topics in that book with a lot of uh, very impressive authors. Uh, the one relevant for our discussion today, which Michael was the lead author on, is called Put a Price on It, the How and Why of Carbon Pricing. Uh, we also have Frank Macchirola, who's the Senior Vice President of Policy, Economics, and Regulatory Affairs at the American Petroleum Institute, which is the trade group for the oil and gas industry. Uh, been around for over 100 years, has about 600, over 600 mem business members right now. Uh, Frank has also previously served in senior Senate positions, including a staff director for the Energy and Natural Resources uh, Committee. Uh, we have Laura Brennan, uh, who's a senior policy advisor uh, at the Nature Conservancy, which is one of the most significant and effective environmental organizations in the world. Since its founding in the 50s, uh, the organization's grown over a million members and operates in more than 70 countries. But for today's purposes, at least, we'll be talking about what happens uh, in the US. And Laura, is that's where she's focused as she uh, deals with state and federal policy issues. And she comes to TNC after some stints in the private sector as well. Um, then we have Mike Catanzaro, uh, who's the president and chief policy officer at this uh, CGCN group, which is a government affairs firm in DC. Mike's also held uh, very senior positions in the executive and legislative branch, most recently serving as special assistant to President Trump for domestic energy and environment. And before that was a senior policy advisor to former House Speaker Boehner and in the Senate and other places as well. And uh, I know uh, these panelists, uh, personally, it's a, it's a great group and we're really looking forward to the discussion. So uh, with that, I will... Uh, pause and uh, turn it over to Michael and uh, and let you go from there with the presentation. Thanks very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I was trying to think of the right title for this. So let me make your screen while I do that. Uh, and it's natural to go with the chap the title of the chapter we had, but in the book, uh, but I wanted to thought maybe a better one might be uh, the curious case of carbon pricing in the United States. Uh, and so let me try and march through a couple slides, which will hopefully set the scene a little bit. So why is it the curious case of carbon pricing in the US? So there's an alternate reality. If we don't have carbon pricing, we actually are living in that alternate reality. Uh, and that alternate reality is where 
we actually do have a carbon policy. It is uh, in bits and pieces. We have particular policies for livestock management. We have particular policies for solar uh, photovoltaic subsidies, cash for clunkers, energy efficiency, like on and on and on, endless laundry list of policies. Uh, if there's one thing that's common across them, it's, and this chart is meant to illustrate this, it's how expensive they are uh, on, not all of them, but mo many of them are quite expensive. Uh, so the cost per ton uh, from these various policies is depicted here. Uh, and you can see uh, there's a wide range of prices. Uh, if you were, and remember a ton is a ton, regardless of whether you got it for the clean power plant or methane flaring or low carbon fuel standards. So it's kind of like we're going to the grocery store. Uh, there's the on sale aisle uh, and there's the, uh, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue aisle. They're, but they're both selling the same thing. There's no difference in quality. And we continually keep choosing the Saks Fifth Avenue's uh, aisle. As a counterpoint, we could be using markets uh, and using carbon pricing. And here I put as vertical lines, the price that prevails uh, in the Reggie market in New England and the California market. And you can see you can get much cheaper deals on reducing a ton of carbon if you were to rely on markets and uh, it, as opposed to this kind of piecemeal approach. So that's why I wanted, one of the reasons I wanna say why it's curious, it's curious. Uh, we seem to like more expensive tons of carbon uh, and we seem to care a lot about which sector they come from rather, even though the planet could care less uh, which sector they come from. Uh, so that, that's just a level set. Now, what would happen if we actually had carbon pricing? Uh, what would happen is we could totally reshape energy markets. Uh, and so let's start with the power or the electricity markets. Uh, and here's the cost of building, uh, levelized costs of the cost per kilowatt hour of new plants, uh, say an existing coal plant, a conventional coal plant, natural gas plant, a nuclear plant. Uh, that would come online in 2024. I say 2024, just to put everything on a level playing field with nuclear, which takes a while to build. Uh, and what you can see is existing coal plants and natural gas plants are the winners here. Uh, and in fact, and, and here we're comparing to renewables and renewables with various forms of backup to deal with inter intermittency. Uh, and what's striking is that if you don't account for carbon, it's obvious what we're gonna get. We're gonna get more fossil fuels. Uh, if you start to put a price on carbon, and here I'm going to put on the Obama and Biden, uh, the Biden interim social cost of carbon, which is $51 a ton. If you were to put that on, you can see the playing field start to change. Uh, natural gas plants uh, still look like a winner, but no one in their right mind would use coal. Uh, the playing field would be shifted and coal would just look too expensive. And then you would start to see some of the renewables look like they can be competitive. Uh, I, my own view from my research is that, that that $51 a ton is probably too low given the changes in markets, uh, given our changes in our understanding about climate change. And so if you were to go say to $125 a ton, which I think is easily justifiable, uh, you know, lo and behold, you have a totally different uh, scenario. Nuclear, which is like dead on the side of the road without carbon pricing. Uh, suddenly is very, very competitive. Uh, we'd probably be building a lot more nuclear plants. Uh, you'd have wind, on onshore wind with battery backup batteries, which are still pretty expensive, would be a winner. No one in their right mind would build a coal plant. And even natural gas uh, would start to have a hard time to compete uh, in the energy sector. So we're choosing to have a particular form of energy markets, uh, and that determines what kind of energy sources we're gonna use. And what this is meant to illustrate is if we were to level the playing field and penalize fossil fuels for the damages that they're causing, uh, we would have a, you know, it's a choice. We'd have a very different world. Uh, so out of our chapter, we came up with five principles to guide carbon pricing. Uh, if we're the US to do that, the first is that there should be a uniform economy-wide carbon price. You shouldn't have different prices in different sectors. Uh, the second is that the social cost of carbon, that is the damages with the release of an additional ton of, from the release of an additional ton of CO2 are a really good benchmark for the level of a carbon tax. Uh, the third is 
once you sign up for carbon pricing, it's much harder and more difficult to justify having technology and sector specific mandates. And they're ultimately just going to reduce uh, the cost effectiveness. Uh, finally, there's two other, what I would call them design features of carbon pricing. Uh, the two large complaints is well, what about low income households and what about American industries that pollute a lot, uh, say relative who have to compete with say Chinese industries that don't. I kind of find that those red herring uh, arguments against carbon pricing because design fe there are two easy design features of a carbon of carbon pricing policy that would easily satisfy those. One would or, or, or remove those concerns. One would be just rebating of uh, revenues to low income households. Uh, and and the second is the kind of border tariff adjustments that uh, people have been talking about recently, and Senator Coons, I think, has introduced a bill on both of which, could be done very easily and address those concerns. Uh, so the, let me now just turn internationally, and this is a little bit why I wanna come back to the curious case of carbon pricing in the United States. Uh, we're an outlier, there's American exceptionalism here. Uh, the world has gotten its act together and said, well, you know, I, if I'm gonna be going for carbon, I really don't wanna buy it at 10 times the price I have to. Uh, and many, many other parts of the world have uh, signed on for carbon pricing. You know, most recently, uh, China has announced, not announced, started one uh, for its power plants. Uh, the EU has a long running robust one. Uh, as I mentioned, there are parts of the United States that have them. And uh, so this is not like an idea from outer space. This is an idea that China uh, and many other parts of the world seem quite capable uh, of implementing. So. I'll just end with this, a poll that uh, the Energy Policy Institute near Chicago ran. Uh, I, I, look, I'm not blind to the politics, I, I, but I don't, I think they're less challenging than people sometimes realize. Uh, you know, a lot depends on how you ask the questions, but 44% of Americans support carbon tax. This was, I think, a, a year and a half ago, 29% oppose one. If you say you're gonna use the revenues for R&D for renewable energy, suddenly that goes up to almost 60% who support it. Uh, and it's about 50% if carbon tax, if the revenues be rebated to households. So uh, thank you for letting me kind of level set here. And I uh, look forward to this discussion. Uh, th thanks, Michael. Uh, very, very informative and lots to unpack there, which we will do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, I just want to mention, I forgot to before, that uh, anybody who's viewing this uh, should feel free to use the Q&A function uh, on the Zoom to submit uh, some questions. I'm not promising that we will get to all of them, but uh, uh, certainly be interested in, in hearing if people have particular questions and, and then we can uh, try to get them to our panelists before we finish up. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Um, now we'll, we'll, we'll turn to some of our other panelists. And um, first, let me, let me go to Frank. And Frank, um, Michael's talked about the case for carbon pricing and, and discussed uh, uh, some of the components of it. Back in March of this year, API endorsed uh, carbon pricing in a, in a, in a statement. Uh, like many industries, the oil and gas industry has evolved in its position on both climate and, and potential remedies for climate uh, over the years. So can you take us through, uh, you've been at the organization, I guess, for at least five years or so now. Can you take us through um, the evolution, I guess, of, of, of your industry and how you uh, arrived at this statement recently? Sure. Th thanks for the question and the and the introduction as well, Jeff. Appreciate it. It's good to be with you all. And um, thanks thanks to Michael for that great presentation. It was really um, informative and uh, a lot to think about and and a lot uh, that that I agreed with from it. Um, you know, in terms of API, I I joined API uh, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. And when I joined, we had a lot of member company. We had a number of member companies that had that were evolving on the issue of uh, climate change and on specifically on the on the issue of uh, whether to support uh, carbon price. The association itself 
uh, lagged behind in some ways its, its members on the issue. Most of our advocacy around the work uh, on, the, on the issue rather was uh, in opposition to proposals that were being offered, some at the state level, some at the federal level. Um, but in terms of establishing a policy, we really did not have one to any great degree. Um, fast forward um, a couple of years, uh, we began from a governance perspective internally within the organization um, to work these issues in a more formal way. So we set up a climate change committee internally that was uh, staffed by the experts on climate change issues within the member companies. We also began to take more uh, public positions around uh, not just you know, the questions about the science of climate change, but really about what we were gonna do about it as an industry and as a country and as a world. And then uh, from the formation of that governance, we then began to kind of map out what policies we think as an industry would be best address this issue. Uh, we fundamentally arrived uh, before uh, announcing it, we fundamentally arrived at the idea that, you know, in part because of the, the you know, some of the, the points that Michael made with regard to, uh, you know, duplicative uh, regulatory and legislative regimes at the state level, um, at the federal level, um, we arrived at the idea that the most meaningful way to address this uh, issue uh, was, and as, as, assuming starting with the point that what you want to achieve here is the most emissions reductions at the least cost across the economy. We thought it would be best to apply a, an, an economy-wide carbon price policy um, that, uh, that, it, that it addressed the issue uh, of border adjustment uh, that address this question of, of leakage because we recognize that this is a global issue. Um, but, and, and that wasn't, you know, I, I should add, this is a panel on carbon pricing. That wasn't the sole objective of the member companies and the industry in addressing climate change. We've adopted a climate action framework that has five principles behind it. It includes both policies that the government should take action on and voluntary efforts that our industry is gonna take across the value chain from upstream, midstream and downstream to address emission reduction. So, you know, we think this is a comprehensive approach to addressing it. Um, you know, I, I know Michael talk a little bit about the, the political challenges associated with it and Michael did as well. We recognize uh, those challenges. Many of the folks uh, here have been through some of these fights in other capacities. So we recognize just how challenging this issue can be from a political standpoint. But uh, believe it or not, we don't start our policy uh, formation here at API deciding what we think has 100% chance of passing. <laughs> we, we start our formation uh, for policies, uh, number one, focused on the mission of the organization, which is to promote uh, safety globally across the industry and to influence public policy on behalf of a strong oil and gas industry in the United States. And so that's how we look at this issue. Does it promote the best interests of our industry? And we think it does. We think ultimately sending a price signal uh, will enhance and enable the investments in technology and innovation that are gonna be required to address this issue I think a starting point uh, is with this with this type of policy. So that that's sort of the that's that's our thinking and that's that's our evolution on 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 the issue, Jeff. Okay. No, th th thanks, Frank. And we'll, we'll get into kind of where we go from here uh, in a minute. Laura, I'd like to <clears throat> ask you a sim similar question, which is that TNC has also endorsed pricing, but has made it clear in, in your framework that it's part of a, a larger toolbox um, set of tools that, that you think are important for addressing climate. So can you also take us through a little bit of TNC's thinking from a environmental uh, NGO and, and how that fits into this dynamic? Sure. 
Um, so we we start with kind of the same basic question as as Mike or sorry as Frank as Frank um, started with is if our goal is to get deep meaningful greenhouse gas emissions, how do you do that um, in the most efficient and effective way possible um, and at the lowest cost? There's no reason to spend money where you don't need to spend money. Um, and and when you ask the when you frame the question that way, a price on carbon naturally rises up as a very important part of the solution. Um, when you, that said, even with the price on carbon, there are going to be lots of parts of the economy that are gonna be hard to decarbonize. Um, and unless, even if you, even at the high, the higher ends of the spectrum for, for a price, um, and there are gonna be a lot of solutions that are gonna be hard to mobilize even with the price on carbon. And so that's why TNC tends to, uh, or talks about a price on carbon as um, an important part of the solution set as, a, as an important part of the suite of solutions that we'll need uh, to, to enact in order to um, meet a net zero by mid-century goal, um, which is what scientists say that we need to, in order to be able to stave off of the worst impacts of climate change. Right. Thanks, Laura. Um, and, and we're going to come back to you and ask you uh, to talk a little bit about some of the various environmental groups and 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 some of their views on on, on this issue as well. Um, Mike, let me let me uh, come back to, or come to you now. And you have a long history of these issues. Um, could you evaluate the current um, state of play politically? Um, and how, if at all, it's different than what we've seen, you know, five or 10 years ago, or if you even want to go further back, back to you know, John McCain's cap and trade bill in, in 2003. Yeah, well, first, thanks, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Uh, great panel today, and Michael, great presentation. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I don't think the politics of this issue have really changed much over the years. I mean, I think you could actually go back to probably the BTU tax in 1993 and look at you know what happened politically from that. There are a lot of members who felt the scars of the BTU tax uh, when they took a vote on it. Of course, the Senate didn't act on it and the House was sort of left hanging out to dry. The same sort of thing occurred uh, with Waxman-Markey in, in 2009 where the House really went out. Uh, again, they kind of walked the plank and took some, it was really a tough vote at the end of the day. And then of course we know what happened uh, in the Senate where the bill kind of imploded. Uh, in fact, there were a number of moderate Democrats who stood up and said they were opposed to it. It was really uh, those, there were that contingent that really I think was responsible for it in good part, uh, the bill's demise. And as you recall, uh, at that point in time, uh, the Senate had about 58 or 59 Democrats and still couldn't get through at the end of the day. Now, much has changed, no question about it. I mean, I think a lot of those moderate Democrats in the Senate, of course, are gone. You don't really have moderates, many moderates in either party. But at the end of the day, if you're talking about carbon pricing, if you specifically you mean a carbon tax, um, certainly on the right, uh, the opposition to it is pretty nearly unanimous. And we saw that again with, you know, Congressman Scalise, who's the second in charge in the House Republicans, just reintroduced his anti-carbon tax resolution in May. He's introduced that. Uh, every Congress since 2013, when Republicans were in control, it passed overwhelmingly with Republican support. Very few Republicans at the end of the day uh, voted against that. Uh, he has a lot of support again for, for pushing that. Um, and again, I think you see the same thing with, with Senate Republicans. And so the question, the perennial question is, is there a middle ground here? Can both sides come together? Um, and uh, there are things where both sides have come together. There's no question about it. I mean, if you look at 45Q, um, you look at some of the energy bills that have passed over the last couple of years uh, that were sent to President Trump, which he signed. Um, there are things where you can come together, but when you start talking about policies where you're getting into raising energy costs for consumers, and even if you're talking about sensible proposals that, that make sense, or you're talking about cap and dividend or returning um, or, or sending checks to low-income folks to help offset costs, it's really not moving the needle. They don't really move the needle at the end of the day. And so uh, when it comes to carbon pricing, I think if there actually were to be some sort of acceptance of it or openness to it on the right, what you'd have to see is some sort of acceptance on the other side that you could deal with the existing kind of regulatory morass that Michael talked about, uh, the redundant uh, policies, the sort of um, patchwork that really gets very costly at the end of the day. I think a lot of Republicans are asking, well, 
why would we pass a carbon tax on top of all of that? Is there a way we can streamline and rationalize that? Now, I think it's unreasonable in the extreme to expect that you could just wipe all of that away. But again, is there a way where you could put a bill together to get a handle on that and, and to reduce some of that, shrink it, streamline it, and then have a much simpler, uh, uniform, transparent carbon price across the economy? That seems to make sense to some Republicans that even conservative Republicans that I talk to, but I just don't think that's that's going to be in the offing. So at the end of the day, I just I don't see carbon pricing um, uh, really catching much uh, fire in the Congress. And as as you know, what we're talking about in this reconciliation bill is a clean energy standard, not a carbon tax. That seems to be a lot of where the energy is right now, what the folks are talking about. Mike, and, and just to uh, take the, 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 the regulatory piece a, a, a step further, Michael, in, in your presentation, you talked about the prices for the various sectors with, with sort of current approaches. And I guess we'll start with you and then maybe go around. But from, from your standpoint, do, do, do you see a, the, the rationale for, for, for doing it that way? Um, and you know, are, are there certain sectors that you would say, well, that actually, that sort of approach makes sense. And then, and then uh, Frank and Laura, as, as, we, as we get to you, and, and Mike, you can comment on this as well. Um, what is the, your various organizations positions on kind of this regulatory uh, relief part that, that arguably would come along with some sort of deal that Mike has discussed? Yeah, so uh, th thanks for the excellent question. Uh, is there a rationale for doing it in this piecemeal way? I think that's the question. Uh, and I think as always, you have to ask compared to what? Uh, and if the alternative world is no carbon policy, I think a lot of people think that uh, this piecemeal uh, approach is better as a way of getting started and maybe building some momentum and one thing leading uh, to another. I think viewed in isolation can be hard to justify uh, some of this, uh, a good number of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, it has the unfortunate flavor uh, that we're constantly, you know, choosing much more expensive uh, abatement versions of CO2 than are, than, than are necessary. Uh, and I think you know, on the blackboard economics is super simple. Set an economy-wide common price for carbon and just let it roll from there and see what happens. Maybe there's some complementary policies that are necessary in particular sectors, maybe not. You'd want to look for market failures. I think there probably is a market failure with respect to, say, uh, network externalities and recharging stations associated with electric vehicles. Uh, but I'd be searching for the market failures. And, but what we shouldn't lose sight of here is the number one market failure here is it's basically free uh, to cause climate change right now. Uh, and that uh, we, sh you know, we you can get a little bit caught up in the nastiness of this small regulation and that small regulation. Uh, but it is totally, you know, it is largely free to cause climate change. And that's the, the, the number one problem right now. I would be interested in this group discussing, uh, you know, there's one idea which you, you pointed to is that, oh, well, if people would just make a good faith agreement to swap regulations uh, for carbon pricing, that's the only thing that's in the way politically. I, you know, I, I'm not really so sure that that's true. Uh, and maybe it's worth picking at that and having some of the people who work in Washington a little bit more than I do as uh, talk about whether or not that's true. Right. Yeah, Frank, why don't we go over to you? I know the API statement um, has, has mentioned some, some of the aspects of regulatory um, relief, but it hasn't necessarily delineated exactly what components it would be. Can you take us through a little bit of your thinking on that? Yeah, I guess the one, um, one thing I just note on the previous comment about it being entirely free, I'm not sure that's exactly the case because of your first chart that showed all of the various policies that incentivize uh, competitive, uh, you know, fuels or energy sources on a basis of GHG of, of low GHG. So, you know, if you're competing against electric vehicles, if you're competing against renewables, 
uh, maybe there's not a cost associated with you, but the government has come in in various forms and said there's either a subsidy or a lower cost because you're a low emission uh, source. On the, on the question of, um, you know, regulatory relief, you know, that's one of the principles that we laid out that whatever is done on a carbon pricing policy, it should not be duplicative. Um, we don't, uh, you know, we don't articulate an entire uh, elimination of all of the various uh, laws and regulations uh, associated with uh, GHG emission reductions. I think that would be, as, as, as Mike noted, I mean, that's, that's probably, it's not probably as politically untenable, um, but we do recognize both from a political standpoint as well as from a rational policy standpoint, uh, there needs to be some rationalization and not just putting a carbon tax on top of an RFS, on top of a electric vehicle mandate, on, on top of a renewable portfolio standard and saying we've solved climate change. Laura, let me turn to you and if, if, if you could give us some thoughts on that. And also I'd be interested in um, other environmental groups have rejected carbon pricing sort of straight out and you know presumably prefer more of a regulatory or sectoral approach and if you could after you talk a little bit about tnc maybe you can give us some thoughts about why that may be um so first i'd, I'd start from the um from the comments that that others have made about you know what is politically tenable and what that deal will look like if in fact if it ever is able to be put together with enough support to, to pass both chambers of Congress, um, there is likely going to be some kind of regulatory pause or um, moratorium or um, trade-off there. Um, that has to be evaluated in the context of whatever that deal is and what, um, what other policies are being uh, considered and, and put into place at the same time in terms of the overall impact that it could have on, on greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions reductions and, um, you know, the, uh, and climate policy. Um, so, but if we think about what that, what that, what those trade-offs might be and how that um, compromise might be reached, uh, there, there are some, um, there are some models out there that uh, give a hint to, to where you might be able to find some room for uh, some room for uh, uh, alignment between the different stakeholders. Um, the Market Choice Act uh, by uh, Representative Fitzgerald and uh, Carbajal in the House is, is one example. And there they put kind of a, a 10 year moratorium specifically on EPA's ability to regulate based on the greenhouse gas uh, or, or CO2 emissions um, that still allows other types of, uh, you know, still allows other types of regulations based on NACs and, and other things for, for human health reasons. Um, and it also has, a, um, has a, a specific snapback provision where if you're not meeting the very strong um, emissions targets that are, that are uh, outlined in the bill um, or after a certain period of time, the uh, that regulatory power returns. Um, so it's that kind of nuance that um, that you might be able to find a compromise uh, or, or and a solution that can work for for different parties um, and different stakeholders. When it comes to um, when it comes to kind of where the environmental community is in general on carbon pricing, um, it is very much a spectrum at this point. Um, we've seen. We've seen some uh, groups that in the past have been supportive of a carbon price um, start raising questions. Uh, a, a lot of those questions have to do with the um, with equity and, um, the, and and questioning the overall efficacy of a carbon price and the um, potential for a market based solution to uh, to um, increase inequities, so increase the, the exposure to co-pollutants that you would see with um, coming out of uh, manufacturing facilities with CO2 emissions, um, kind of concentrating those, those emissions into areas that are already overburdened with pollution 
and that sort of thing. Um, we can- but Laura, can I, can I stop you there? I'm curious about that one. Uh, like, <laughs> it's a super important point, which is it's the pollution hotspot idea. Like mm -hmm. all the manufacturing will go to Richmond, California or something like that. Uh, and then uh, that, and then all the pollution will be concentrated there. Well, we like, first of all, like Mary Nichols was like kind of taken down on that, uh, uh, that idea. It turned out when you looked at the data, it wasn't even true. Uh, so why is this ghost uh, so effective or boogeyman? Yeah. Guess, maybe not even a ghost. Uh, yeah. And, I, and, and, and by the way, you could design, you know, even if it were happening, you would have the Clean Air Act as a backup to make sure that uh, for criteria pollutants that doesn't happen. So it, it's, I find it a little off-putting. That it's you know yes. it's a boogeyman for which there isn't even data that supports the existence of the boogeyman. At, at the risk of insulting you and every other economist um, out there, from a from an academic perspective, what you're saying I'm sure makes very very much sense or, or does make sense. Um, th this is not an academic question though when you're talking about people who are experiencing this. Um, in, in their lives and communities that are experiencing, you know, an overburden of pollution. And so, um, you know, we, we can talk about it from, a, from an economic perspective, from what does the data tell us? What, it, how can we, how, what's the policy design? And I will be the first to admit that is where my head goes to when I, when I first started dealing with this issue. Um, and, and yes, I think that there are, um, there are, there are ways to address those concerns. Um, they tend, I, I think they, they come, they, can't, they will come most likely from outside of the actual design of the carbon price itself and are more from the complementary policies and those policies have to be designed. Again, now I'm talking politics. Those, those policies have to be designed with those communities that are impacted and with those stakeholders who are, who are feeling the direct impacts directly involved. The, the Washington, um, the price, the carbon uh, cap and trade system that was just passed in Washington state is a perfect example of that. Um, that, uh, you know, Washington state has tried multiple times to pass a, a price on carbon. Um, the iteration before this one failed because of the, the pushback from the environmental justice committee community. Uh, the, one, the one that just passed um, was done with an alliance and, and having those those folks at the table and designing it and and that's why it was ultimately successful so uh, so let me just clarify like I, I first i like i couldn't agree more on process and bringing all stakeholders involved and making sure stakeholders in, are engaged and so uh and to the degree that that wasn't done in california then you know that's uh, i think people are bearing the fruit of that uh but i really do object to calling it an academic debate uh, in, the, in, in, in the sense that uh, it's an academic debate if we're talking about things that aren't, you know, that are, might be true. Like what I'm talking about is actual people's lived experiences uh, and what is the pollution they face. Uh, and, you know, it turns out in the data, it seems like uh, the cap and trade program in California actually improved people's lived uh, experiences, as I understand. I, I haven't written any of those papers, but uh, as I understand that literature. And so I do think it's important to separate the two and it's not to minimize the importance of process and participatory democracy and all of that. Uh, but I don't think it's academic to talk about, uh, you know, have a boogeyman that's not true, uh, coloring our ability to have, uh, you know, broader achieve broader policy goals. All right, uh, good, good, good discussion. And, and while we're talking about perceptions and how um, uh, some of this may impact the, the political dynamics, I, I wanna start with Frank, but then ha have others as well. Uh, in the news uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a uh, lobbyist from Exxon was uh, caught on tape, I guess, discussing uh, carbon pricing and basically making the point uh, that some of these companies are, are pushing for it, uh, knowing that it's not gonna pass. And it's sort of fed into this narrative that the companies really aren't that serious about, about doing that. Can, can you kind of, and obviously, you know, it's not like API 
you're not speaking on behalf of, of Exxon, but uh, as one of your members in a similarly situated companies, just be interested in in um, what what your thoughts are on that and what API is actually doing to um, to to push on this particular uh, carbon pricing proposals. So the, those statements don't reflect uh, the views of API. They don't reflect the advocacy work of API. They certainly don't reflect any conversations that I've ever had, frankly, within the industry. Um, and uh, number one, I don't think anyone can um, can know can know for sure what's going to pass Congress. If they could, then uh, they'd be very wealthy. Um, and secondly. Uh, you know, I think as a in, as an industry and as an organization, you really harm your credibility across and you know the entire range of your work um, if you were to adopt sort of a, a cynical approach to advocacy where you claimed to support one thing and on the other hand, actually supported something else. So totally inconsistent with um, anything I've been a part of at API and completely um, at odds with the work that we do here and the work that our member companies do. Um, this is an issue that makes environmental sense for our members. It's also an issue that makes business sense. Over and over, you continue uh, to hear from members of our industry that they want greater certainty in the space, that they want a, um, so to speak, market signal to be able to make the investments in technology that's going to be able to bring about a low and zero carbon emission future. They believe the best way to do that is to adopt a policy and a policy yeah. that prices carbon. And in terms of uh, just let me address for a moment the you know possibility of of whether something's going to pass or not. Um, at, you know, I think I, I said at the top we don't adopt policies on the basis of whether or not they're going to pass. It certainly shapes how we try to um, you know shape policy to be able to make sure that our it's going to work for our advocacy, but it certainly doesn't drive our our thinking. Um, and I think the other thing is it's, it's, it's kind of an amazing criticism, uh, to be, you know, to be critiqued for supporting something that's not going to pass, uh, in the views of others in the area of climate, which has been around for a very long time and has had zero success, uh, in passing comprehensive legislation through either house, uh, through, through both houses of Congress. So, you know, I mean, it has as good a chance as any of the other items and that have been offered over the several many years that we've been working on this issue. And I think the, the other thing to, to worth noting is it seems like, um, you know, if, if you want to kind of learn a legislative lesson, I think healthcare is a really instructive uh, area to look. Um, in constructing healthcare reform, um, the, the most effective way it turned out to do it was to construct legislative reform within the system as it already operated, within the private insurance market, within private hospital systems, not creating a whole new government run program with, you know, every hospital looking like the VA and insurance company being a part of the federal government. It was actually an in incremental approach to the issue. I think if you want to address, and the other factor that I think that, that weighed in very importantly on the healthcare reform was that the administration at the time brought in pharma and hospitals and uh, you know, the, the insurers. It was, a, it was a recognition that you needed support from the most impacted private sector industries to be able to make progress on the issue. On climate, it seems like everyone says the radical approach to all of this is to adopt a carbon price that's supported by the most impacted stakeholders. Instead, you have to in, in, turn our entire energy system on its head and impose radical emission reductions in the short term. 
That's the best legislative approach to it. I just don't understand that. I don't agree with it. Right. Okay, well, let, let me bring Mike in on this. Mike, um, as, as, as you think about the, the, the Exxon comment, I'm just wondering whether you think it actually has any impact in the debate or the discussion at all. Will it scare away certain people from being involved or, or pushing a particular policy? And, and also, you know, Republicans as a party are often um, sort of accused of being in the pocket of, of industry. You, you have API, you have a bunch of other business groups that have also been pushing for carbon pricing, yet you don't see a lot of or hardly any Republican members who even talk favorably about it at all. So how do you analyze those dynamics? Well, I, you know, I think on the Exxon comments and the videos, I mean, I, I'm sort of with Frank. I mean, I, I been talking to industry folk on a day-to-day -day basis and talking to clients. I, I never heard anything come out of their mouths to suggest that they're behind a particular policy because they know it wouldn't pass. And I think I agree with Frank in a sense that we're constantly told, and I think it's right to say that, you know, economists tell us, as Michael has told us, uh, the best economists in the world have told us that the most efficient way to go about addressing this problem is to just to do a carbon price, to do a carbon tax across the economy. And then when groups support it, they're told that they're being cynical because it'll never pass. Well, as Frank said, none of these comprehensive approaches have passed either. You know, we looked at cap and trade bills in 2003 and five and 2008, 2009 and 10. We had a BTU tax, as I said, back in 1993. We've been at this for a very long time and we haven't been able to develop the, the consensus, the bipartisan consensus to get it done. And, and I think in part, that is because this is a very important issue, an important problem that has to be addressed. But I would say that the voters really haven't uh, given their, their rep representatives, the members of Congress, uh, the sense that this is a top issue for them. Um, I mean, if you ask voters in the abstract, polling over and over again says 75, 80% of voters think that climate change is a, a real phenomenon. It's something we have to deal with, very important problem is something they worry about. But when you ask them, and you can look at the Gallup surveys going back many years, to rank order climate change as an issue when they go to the polls, what they vote on, it usually appears out of 19 or 20 issues kind of dead last. So it just hasn't risen up to the top uh, you know, with the economy and jobs and healthcare and crime and all the other issues, immigration even, uh, that voters seem to care about. And so until that happens, uh, I just don't think you're going to see a lot of movement on this issue. And so whether it's a carbon tax or cap and trade or whatever method or clean energy standard, uh, until that happens, I just don't think you're going to have an enduring bipartisan consensus to back the policy. It's just, it's not there yet. And I think people, analysts make the mistake of assuming that just because industry is for a carbon price or for doing something of a mandatory nature on climate that Republicans are going to change their tune, that that will not happen. It has not happened. We saw that during the Waxman-Markey debate, and again in 20 in 2009, where the electric utility industry got on board with that bill, and you know, Republicans on a whole voted against it. And uh, again, they're just not seeing it from their voters that they need to get on board with this at the end of the day. And that's why I think this these policies aren't getting through, whether or not they make academic sense or whether it makes sense in the real world or not. Could, could I just jump in and uh, this is a really fascinating conversation and I, I want to try and connect two threads here. Uh, the, what I see is like a challenge, I will, you know, I take a, uh, I take Frank at, at his word about uh, what goes on inside API, but you know, the challenge of course is that story resonated so much because at some level, lots of people think that is actually what goes on. Uh, is, and so what could API do? I kind of mean that as a question, uh, particularly given Exxon's history, uh, what could API do to signal that they really do want a carbon tax? And, you know, is there some kind of costly action they could take or, or other industry groups uh, could take that would make clear uh, that this uh, isn't just kind of for show? Which, because I think I think that's the challenge that API kind of has, and that other organizations have, and and then I want to try and connect that to uh, what Mike was just saying, which is an important point, which comes across uh, in, in in the polling that climate change is not often 
appear at the very top. I don't know if it appears at the very bottom. You can ask questions in particular ways and get answers that uh, you probably different people like better depending on how you ask the question. But what I wonder about that is, uh, is there a connection between industry uh, industry engagement on this issue and where the, how this polls? Uh, I think there's probably some evidence that that's the case. Uh, and then how can we put this against the international backdrop? And I mean it seriously, like this is American exceptionalism. Uh, we, uh, there's essentially one political party in one country in the top 10 countries in the world uh, that is having a difficult time with climate change. Uh, why is that? How can that be? Okay, let, let, let me do this. I, I think th those are reasonable questions. We're, we're, we're running, uh, we, we got less than 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna ask the panelists to keep their answers um, short, but Frank, why don't I give you a chance to, to jump into that? And then uh, Mike and Laura, if you have anything on that as well, because I, I also do want to cover the international piece for real quickly before we finish. Well, you know, we're, we're an advocacy organization. We're not a legislative or, or the executive branch. So, you know, I think the best way to, um, to indicate that we support a policy is to uh, roll out the policy and announce our support, which we've done. We're actually going to work on putting more specificity around it so policymakers have a greater understanding of exactly what we're talking about with respect to a carbon price. But I think the question should actually be addressed to the administration and to Congress. If you're serious about passing something that's meaningful, um, recognize that the impacted stakeholders uh, are the most helpful in being able to get those things over the finish line. This isn't just me sort of making it up. It's me basing it on the history of legislation over the many years that I've, I've worked on things. Uh, you know, legislation passes when in, when the interested stakeholders support it. That's why Washington, D.C. has such a large advocacy industry. <laughs> um, so, you know, the question really goes to the administration and the Congress. Um, offer something uh, that is around the principles that we've laid out and you will have industry support for it. Mike or Lori, uh, care to comment on that? Yeah, I'll. Um, so, I, I I think those comments reflect a little bit of the of the experience that that we've had uh, recently in in conversations with members of Congress. Um, in some regard, um, you know what what I, I think when you look at across the political spectrum. Um, as Mike laid out to begin with, you know, there's there's the um, you know core of the Republican Party who just is not there. Um, even even with mem even with you know members of their what I would call their traditional constituencies like the business community knocking on their door and saying we do believe in this. You know, we 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 want to see action and, and we would support a price on carbon. Um, and then you couple that with kind of the the pushback now on the left, um, and you know, and coupled with the 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 past experiences and the very hard kind of walk the plank votes that a lot of um, you know a lot of members of Congress still remember or members of the administration still remember, and and there's just a lot of a lot of folks who are very um, trepidatious about even putting this 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 kind of proposal on the table. Um, on the polling itself, um, we've we've recently done some polling uh, across a, a number of different states, and they, it shows um, similar levels of support uh, that, of the poll that Michael put up, kind of around in the 40, 40 to fifty percent uh, range of voters supporting a price on carbon um, or a carbon tax. The opposition numbers are pretty low; it's you know in the twenty percent range too. So, I mean, what that, what I read into those numbers is yes, no, you know, the, the general public is not clamoring for this, but the general public probably also couldn't explain to you how a carbon tax would actually work or a cap and trade system would actually work and how it would, would impact their lives. Um, so is there a, is, is there a kind of, um, 
scenario where you could see some of the you know core constituencies in Washington coming together and and pushing for a carbon tax with the with the you know armed with the data of this this won't actually hurt you that much at home it might hurt you with a with you know one small group of voters but the general public uh, can get behind this especially once they once they understand what the benefits are thanks Laura and M M Mike maybe I'll just turn to you and and sort of round things out we we now that we're in reconciliation and proposals are starting to fly around um, on the international side of things, um, we've seen that the, the EU, which has an emissions trading system, has discussed having some sort of border tax adjustment to make sure that they aren't flooded with um, products and their industry isn't hurt for having an internal uh, carbon price. Um, here, here in the US, we saw yesterday I guess, or two days ago, that uh, Senator Coons and um, Representative Peters introduced a, a, a sort of border tax adjustment to tax um, imports coming in from countries that may not have uh, the same standards that we have in the U.S. So do you see any uh, chance of anything like that being included in any sort of budget reconciliation. I'd also be interested, since Republicans have consistently talked about making sure that the U.S. isn't hurt vis-a-vis um, -vis other countries that have lax uh, standards, um, any chance of any Republican support for something like that? That's a great question, Jeff. I think if if there could be a game changer on the politics of this issue, it, it, it could be what the EU is trying to do with their core carbon border adjustment. Now, I, I will say that, you know, I, I opened up the EU document uh, on the carbon border adjustment and it, it took them about 300 pages just to explain the concept. And I think that that gives you the sense about how difficult it is to, to actually implement this thing. I, Michael may disagree with me that it could be simpler, very simple to, 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 to do this. If that were the case, I think they would have done it already. Um, now, I think uh, the Coons bill is very interesting. I think that will survive in reconciliation because I think the principal uh, objective or the principal motive behind that policy is to raise revenue for the federal government or will raise revenue for the federal government. It will have a budgetary impact. And so if they, the Democrats decide at the end of the day to put that in reconciliation, that will get through and it will pass. Now, the clean energy standard, I think, is a very different thing. They're talking about uh, transforming it and turning it into sort of a carrot and stick approach where you give grants to power plants that meet a certain target and you tax those that don't. Um, it's true that that would have a budgetary impact, but that's an incidental budgetary impact. And I don't think that would survive the bird rule test. But going back to the border adjustment, it'll be interesting to see uh, how long it takes again for the Europeans to put that in place. But if it then starts to have serious economic repercussions for American manufacturing and exports, then you, I wonder if Republicans might start thinking differently about this issue because they'll have to. Now it could be that you know if you have a new president in 2024, a Republican president, they launch uh, some sort of campaign against what the Europeans are doing. But I don't think the Europeans are really going to care at the end of the day. So this could be the one thing that could force Republicans' hands. I, I don't think that, with all due respect to Frank and others in the industry who are sensibly talking about carbon policy proposals. I don't think that's going to change Republicans' minds at the moment, but this could, depending on how it plays out. It's something to watch very, very carefully, I think. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mike. And in terms of things to watch, uh, the clean energy standards is also something that's there. And I'll, I'll just mention uh, that Conserve America is likely to have a webinar to explore the CES uh, sometime soon, and we'll invite everyone to participate. Uh, we're down to probably, well, I guess we're probably at time. So I will just give any of the panelists uh, 10 seconds or so if anybody wants to make any any final comment, but we'll keep it uh, uh, extremely short. So anybody at the last moment? Thanks for hosting the panel. It's a terrific discussion. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Well, we have, we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that as, uh, as, as the last comment. We appreciate everybody joining us. It was a really uh, interesting discussion. It'll uh, continue on our website if folks want to come back to it. And we look forward to being in touch with everyone in the future. But thanks again all.